إن الحمد لله نحمده ونستعين ونستغفر ونؤمن به توكل عليه ونعوذ بالله من شرور أنفسنا ومن سيئات أعمالنا من يهده الله فلا مدل له ومن يدل فلا هادي أما بعد as we approach the middle of Ramadan many of us may be struggling to meet our own expectations for this month you know, many a times we start Ramadan with very high goals and very high expectations of ourselves you know, we say things like I'm going to recite the entire Quran five times you know, I'm going to pray Tahajjud every night I'm going to give a lot of money in charity I'm not going to commit a single sin for the entire month and a week into Ramadan we start to fail we start to slip up we start to make mistakes we get tired we fall into human error and then we become frustrated with ourselves and we start to think that maybe I'm not good enough you know maybe I'm not worthy of Ramadan maybe I'm not a good Muslim and I think the, the problem starts with our definition of what is a good Muslim because too often we have unrealistic expectations of what Allah expects from us that we think that Allah expects us to be perfect we think that Allah expects us to be you know these perfectly pious creatures that have no faults and that's not the case because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala before creating the human being had already created a creation that is perfect in its worship of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and that is the malaika, the angels the angels do not have free will the angels do not experience temptation the angels do not have flaws they do whatever Allah commands them to do they are perfect in the worship of Allah Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created the human beings to be different from the angels and even in the beginning the angels could not understand why Allah was creating something that was flawed and so when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala told the angels as narrated in surah al-Baqarah he told the angels that he's going to create a successor on earth he's going to create the human race the angels asked why would you create something that could shed blood and cause chaos why would you create something that, that has the potential for evil you know, the, the angels exist why would Allah create humans and Allah simply replied I know that which you do not know and from this reply of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala we can understand that there is a hidden wisdom in the creation of the human being and that the flawed nature of the human being is intentional Allah created us to be creatures that have flaws that have mistakes that have weaknesses we were not meant to be perfect we were not meant to be flawless rather it is in our constant struggle against our soul that we find our connection with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and our reward it's not in attaining perfection but in constantly struggling against our soul now recently there was a article about how AI is better at worship than human beings right an experiment was done and the results of the experiment was that artificial intelligence and robots are better at worship than humans because AI doesn't lose concentration it doesn't get distracted it doesn't have faults and and the article said that are humans going to be replaced by AI in worship and that got me thinking it made me realize that people don't understand what worship is because if you program a robot to worship and it's just doing what it was programmed to do that's not real worship that's not what Allah is looking for Allah has gifted us with free will and when we choose to use that free will to worship him even though our nafs wants to do the opposite even though there is so much temptation to do the opposite even though we have full free will to do the opposite but we still choose to worship him no matter how flawed that worship is that is what is beloved to Allah that choice 
that choice to worship him even though we are flawed in our nature and in our worship and i want us to understand that these human flaws of having weaknesses having sins all of this it is intentional it is how allah created us this is mentioned clearly in the quran in the hadith and we see it also in the lives of the sahaba the sahaba were the greatest generation of believers but they were not flawless they also struggled with their desires they also struggled with their sins they also struggled with their mistakes and sometimes we don't realize this because you know too often we discuss their stories in a way where they come across as flawless and perfect and in doing so we create unrealistic expectations of, of what we are supposed to be like but Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us in the Quran insanu humans were created weak meaning this weakness in us is intentional and if you think this verse is talking about physical weakness or something else no it's talking about spiritual weakness Sufyan Asuri rahimahullah in his tafsir of this verse he said when Allah says that humans were created weak he said this means for example he gave the example that when a beautiful woman walks past a man forgets to lower his gaze he said this is what is meant by Allah has created humans weak mind you he's talking about in the time of the Sahaba right the first generation of Muslims but they also struggled with this they also struggled with the lowering of the gaze and he mentioned this by example to show that the weakness meant in this verse is spiritual weakness that Allah intentionally created humans to have within them a spiritual weakness that each of us have our temptations our flaws our sins that we keep falling into this is intentional because if we don't sin we don't make istighfar if we don't make istighfar then Allah's attributes of forgiveness and, rep- and, and accepting repentance cannot be manifest in our lives and so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created us with weaknesses he created us with faults he created us to be creatures who never attain perfection in this life and that's fine as long as we keep trying to please Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and we see the same message conveyed in many of the ahadith the famous hadith where the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said that every son of Adam makes mistakes but the best of those who make mistakes are those who are constantly repenting meaning the children of Adam were not meant to be flawless and perfect creatures we are meant to have mistakes we are meant to have flaws we are meant to have errors but what separates the righteous from from the from the sinful what separates the people of paradise from the people of hell is not the attainment of perfection it is repentance it is sincere repentance to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala whenever we fall into sin going back to what we mentioned earlier you know that people wondered like why can't we have perfect worshippers of Allah flawless worshippers of Allah why can't we be that Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam stated in authentic hadith that if you were to be the kind of creation that does not sin very interesting hadith he says if you had to not commit sins Allah would destroy you Allah would remove you from the face of the earth and replace you with a creation that sins and repents Allah would replace you with a creation that sins and repents what is the meaning of this hadith this hadith means that Allah created us to be creatures who repent for our sins now if we are sinless we're not going to repent we have nothing to repent for and if we are sinless then there is no way for us to see Allah's attributes of al-ghafoor and al-tawab because we are never seeking forgiveness so Allah would have replaced us with a creation that does that so Allah can be al-ghafoor al-tawab towards those creations so understand that the sinful nature of human beings is part of our design and struggling against this nature is part of being human and part of being Muslim and everyone has their flaws some people struggle to lower their gaze some people struggle with their tempers some people struggle with stinginess some struggle with racism some struggle with bad language some struggle with addictions everyone's struggle is different 
But we all have faults in us. We all have flaws in us. We all have parts of us that can be improved. And yes, we'll never become perfect, but we can recognize our flaws and work towards improving them. And the Prophet wasallam stated that none of you will enter paradise because of your deeds. You will only enter paradise because of the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And the Sahaba asked, even you, Ya Rasulullah? He said, even me. Now, when Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa said that we will not enter Jannah because of our deeds, there's two angles to this. Right? One angle is, Jannah is so perfect and amazing that none of us deserve it. Right? What can any of us say we have done to be worthy of eternal pleasure? On the other angle, that we are so flawed, we are so sinful, that if we get into Jannah, if we get into Jannah, it is the mercy of Allah. It is really the mercy of Allah for overlooking our faults, for overlooking our sins. Because we all know what we have done in our lives that is displeasing to Allah. And for Allah to forgive us for that, that is truly His mercy. And we said that the first generation of Muslims, they taught us this. They taught us that even if someone is sinful, even if someone has their flaws, even if someone has their problems, they can still be close to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. They can still get to Jannah. It's not about being flawless, it's about sincerely trying your best. So from amongst the Sahaba, there was a man who was addicted to alcohol. And he would often show up in public drunk. And he would often get punished for being drunk in public. And it reached a point where the Sahaba got so frustrated with him, that when they were punishing him, they began to curse him, and they began to use bad words against him. And Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa he stopped him. He stopped him, he said, don't say things like that. Because he loves Allah and his messenger. So here we have a man, clearly with a fault, clearly with a flaw, with an addiction problem. A man who even in modern society, we may look down upon him. A man who's addicted to alcohol. Yet Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa is pointing out that he has good in him as well. He loves Allah and his messenger. We have another story amongst the Sahaba. That there was a famous Sahabi by the name of Hanzala. And Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa noticed that Hanzala stopped coming for the halakat, he stopped coming for the lectures. So he sent Abu Bakr to find out why. Abu Bakr goes to the home of Hanzala and Hanzala says, I'm a hypocrite. So Abu, ba- Abu Bakr asked him, what do you mean you're a hypocrite? He says, when we're sitting in the lectures of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa my iman is so high and I feel so close to Allah and I feel like I'm going to be a perfect Muslim. Then I go back home and get involved with my family and I forget about Allah. And I go to work and get involved in my business and I forget about it. And, and I'm not on the same level when I'm at home or when I'm at work than when I'm in the company of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And Abu Bakr said, if that is hypocrisy, I'm in the same state. Because this happens to me too. That when you are at home with your family, when you are at work, you're not in the same state and level of iman as when you are in a Islamic circle. Even more so when the Islamic circle is with the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So they go to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and they ask him about this. They tell him the story and what happened. And Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam says, that is normal. That is normal. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam told him, had you remained in this state of iman at all times, the angels would come down to earth and shake your hands. Why? Because it's not possible. This is like an inhuman level of piety that you're expecting of yourselves. Such an inhuman level of piety that the angels would, would actually come down to earth and shake your hands for it. But we don't know of the angels coming down to earth to shake people's hands. Because people do not reach that level. And so the Sahaba were comforted to know that it is human to go to ups and downs in your faith. And the Prophet ﷺ advised him on that occasion and said, there is a time for this and there is a time for that. I mean, there's a time for being with your family, there's a time for having fun, there's a time for relaxing, there's a time for ibadat, there's a time for work, and you need to give each of them their rights. Allah does not expect perfection from us. So as we enter the second half of Ramadan, some of us may be feeling deflated. We may have feel like we didn't do our best in the first half. We fell into sin. We messed up. You know, we thought we were going to give up an addiction, but we couldn't give it up. We thought we were going to pray to Hajj, but we couldn't wake up on time. We thought we'd recite the entire Quran, but we couldn't. It's fine. You're trying your best. But now as we enter the, ne- the last 10 nights, starting in a few days' time, let's try even harder. 
let's push ourselves even further because the race is not over remember getting to Jannah is not about being flawless it's about sincerely trying your best and Ramadan is that time where we try our best and our best will not be perfect we may not concentrate 100% in our salah we may not go through an entire month without a sin but our best is still our best and if it's sincerely for the sake of Allah it is enough and this is why the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said Man suama ramadana imano wa ahtisaba ghufir lahu ma taqaddama min zambihi Whoever fasts the month of Ramadan sincerely for the sake of Allah hoping for reward all of their sins will be forgiven and he said from one Ramadan to the next is a forgiveness for whatever happened in between notice he did not say that you should be sinless in Ramadan or outside of Ramadan he did not say if you do Ramadan properly you'll be sinless for the rest of your life he simply said you'll be forgiven for whatever happened in between each Ramadan meaning things will happen between the two Ramadans that you will need Allah's forgiveness for and so it's not that we are expected to be sinless but that we are expected to be constantly repenting and constantly seeking Allah's forgiveness and constantly trying our best and if we try our best Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will forgive the rest we ask Allah to forgive our sins to keep us steadfast on the straight path and to give us the correct understanding of Islam subhana rabbika rabbil izzati amma yisifun wa salam al mursaleen walhamdulillahi rabbil alameen Alhamdulillahi wahda wa salatu wa salamu ala man la nabiya ba'da amma ba'da wa in asaka al-hadithi kitabullah wa khayru hadhi hadhi muhammadin sallallahu alayhi wa sallam wa sharru al-umuri muhdathatuha wa kullu muhdathatin bid'a wa kullu bid'atin dalala wa kullu dalalatin fidnar As we enter the last portion of Ramadan we have just two weeks left of this beloved month and the majority of those two weeks will be the last ten nights So just a brief reminder that we are taught to seek out Laylatul Qadr in the last 10 nights of Ramadan and it is from the wisdom of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that he did not tell us the exact night of Laylatul Qadr because had he told us the exact night many of us would only worship him on that night but by keeping it ambiguous we end up exerting ourselves in worship for the entire 10 nights and this is from the wisdom of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala the virtues of Laylatul Qadr are many in the Quran, in Surah Al-Qadr, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us that Laylatul Qadr khayrun min alfi shahr that Laylatul Qadr is better than a thousand months meaning, if you catch Laylatul Qadr with your worship a good deed done on that night would be equal to doing that good deed for over a thousand months and the wisdom behind this is that we do not live that long on earth how do we earn the reward of living many lifetimes? How do we earn the reward of doing hundreds of years of, of good deeds? By catching Laylatul Qadr every year. That's how we earn that reward. So we push ourselves to do the most that we can do in these 10 nights. And there are many things you can do in the last 10 nights of Ramadan to increase your ibadat. Those who can should make itikaf. Itikaf in the last 10 nights of Ramadan is from the highly recommended sunnahs. If we cannot make it tikaf, there are other things we can do as well. P- pray tahajjud, right? Spend as much time as you can in tahajjud. Recite Quran, make dua, make dhikr. Spend time in contemplation. Now, this is an act of worship that's often lost in our times. So to just sit alone and think. To sit and lo- alone and think about your sins, think about your relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Think about how you can be a better Muslim. We need to make time to think about our relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And Aisha radiallahu anha, she asked the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam that if I had to catch Laylatul Qadr, what dua should I make? And he told her to make the dua, Allahumma inna ka afoon tuhibul afu fa afu anna. O oh Allah, you are most forgiving. You love to forgive, so forgive us. Or forgive me. Right? This dua, it is the sunnah to make this dua on Laylatul Qadr. It is what Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa taught to the Sahaba and it is what we should be doing as well. And it goes back to our theme of today's khutbah. We are not meant to be flawless. The fact that we should be spending Laylatul Qadr asking Allah for forgiveness means there are things that need to be forgiven. And so this dua is most sincere 
when you think about the things that you did wrong this year that you sit and think that from last Ramadan till now did I mess up what did I do that, that I really need forgiven what did I do that I want Allah to forgive me for and you think about these deeds and you say oh Allah you are most forgiving you love to forgive so forgive me and you sincerely sincerely repent for these mistakes that we have made throughout the year so let us not allow our flaws and our mistakes to prevent us from excelling in worship in the last few nights of Ramadan. Let us spend the next two weeks increasing in our ibadat. And if we slip up, we will ask Allah for forgiveness and we will try again. And this is how we should live our entire lives. At no point should we think, no matter what we have slipped and fallen into, that I am ruined and there's no way back to Allah. There is always a way back to Allah no matter what sin you have fallen into. There is always a way back to Allah. Through repentance, through seeking forgiveness, through turning your life around, doing more good deeds, reconnecting with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the road to forgiveness is always open as long as we are alive. So do not ever allow shaitan to distract you with the thought that I am too sinful and I am ruined and there is no way back to Allah. There is always a way back to Allah. As long as we continue to seek his forgiveness and to recognize that we are flawed and we are sinful and we are in need of his mercy and we are in need of his forgiveness and to worship him wholeheartedly because of this. We ask Allah to forgive our sins. We ask Allah to make us steadfast. We ask Allah to accept our ibadat from him in this blessed month. Rabbana atina fi dunya hasana wa fil akhirati hasana wa qina adhab al-nar. Rabbana hablana min azwajina wa zurriyatina kurrata a'yun ajalna lil muttaqina imama. Subhana rabbika rabbil izzati amma yasifun. Wassalamun ala mursaleen. Walhamdulillahi rabbil alameen. Aqimi salam.